We are here right now. Got Pastor Steven Anderson with us from Faith Word Baptist in Tempe. Appreciate him coming on here and doing this. Only Pastor Anderson would be crazy enough to do this type of interview. And a lot of people have been, I've gotten a lot of good response from this. I think people are excited about it. Uh, some people are kind of thinking, you know, their expectations are low. Uh, they think this is going to be a softball interview. You know, softball and soap bubbles is how they've been putting it. I like the sound of that. But listen, this is this is big. This is the biggest thing since Katie Couric interviewed Edward Snowden. And uh, th this isn't going to be a letdown like the uh, Bob Gray, Johnny Nixon interview that basically just turned out to be a big tickle fight. All right. We are not going to do that. And so I've made big promises. And so. Hopefully you all will not be disappointed, but I do want to start out before I get into the questions. I kind of want to give people a chance to, to get on uh, and watch a live stream just to kind of just be very clear on what I'm trying to do in this interview. I do have an agenda. There's no doubt about that. Uh, there's no, there's no secrets here, but I do want to start. Uh, I do want to tell everybody because Pastor Anderson, you know, I've been following his ministry for a long time. And honestly, um, when it came to, I got to know him. I originally, uh, when I, I when after not long after starting the church, I started getting a lot of questions from our people about end times, and I started doing some studies on it, and started finding out I didn't know as much as I thought I did on it. I didn't know who Pastor Anderson was, and so I just started talking to a lot of preachers about it. And every time I talk to any preacher, everybody's like, "Have you been listening to that Stephen Anderson?" I'm like, "Who's Stephen Anderson?" I didn't even really know who he was. Looked him up, and I listened to some of his teaching and I heard him use the word post trib and that was enough for me. I shut him off. I quit listening. I didn't pay attention to him anymore. Uh, I knew post tribbers were all kooks and therefore I didn't need to listen to him. And so, because I was thinking maybe mid trip and there's a lot I didn't understand, but the more preachers I talked to, everybody's like, yo, you're sound like Steven Anderson. And so I you know, what's this guy saying? You know, everybody kept bringing him up. I'm trying to talk about the Bible. I'm trying to talk about doctrine. Everybody's talking about Stephen Anderson. So I started watching his stuff. And sure enough, you know, I learned that, you know, uh, I knew quite a bit about this subject and kind of helped me fill in a lot of blank spots that I had. And, um, you know, and as time went on, I, you know, I changed positions on that. And, um, in the last couple of years, I've just listened to, you know, I, I've heard quite a bit of negative stuff thrown his way that I happen to know and a lot of these things aren't true. And I got tired of that. So what I want to do in this, you know, I, I want to rebuke pastors who've allowed their pulpits to become a place where you can just slander, defame, and falsely accuse, just like the devil, and not be held accountable. You know, the internet has made it so any idiot can say whatever they want and not be held accountable. But, you know, you'd think a pulpit in a Baptist church would be a place where we could expect better. And so I'm a, I just want to remind pastors, if you're going to say some of these crazy things about them, make sure you're right. Okay, there are some things that people say about Pastor Anderson that are true. We'll cover some of those things. But I want to encourage those out there maybe that are in the closet, too, on some of these issues to come out, you know, to uh, you know, these attacks on Pastor Anderson, I think, has made people afraid to admit that they are seeing the same things in the Bible, they're afraid of being associated with them. And, and I understand it. So I'm hoping some of these questions will help these people. And, you know, there are, there's a lot of people that are sick of listening to the nonsense coming from pulpits in their churches. And uh, they've been listening to Pastor Anderson. And they're being looked at as infiltrators of being treated badly in their churches. And I got a problem with that. And so I, I do, I want to cover some of these things. And I hope it will be a help. And I hope it will uh, answer a lot of questions that people have because people, people are thinking I'm going crazy too. Pastor Anderson didn't ask me to do this. This was all my idea. I'm constantly getting these things thrown at me. Do you know this about him? Do you know that about him? And just crazy stuff. And most of these preachers too, when they say these things, they've not actually ever watched a whole message by them. They've seen some of the clips and things. They've heard the rumors and they ran with it. And that's ridiculous. There's still something called bearing false witness that we're not supposed to do. And so Pastor Anderson, thank you for coming on, and I just want to start out, um, we're going to keep this part short because a lot of people don't want to hear this, but talk, tell us a little bit about your church and what you guys are doing right now. Your church is a soul winning machine. I mean, it's uh, I think it's incredible what y'all are accomplishing out there in your church of 50, all right? And so uh, what, do you all, what, what do you have to say about Faithful Word and uh, 
tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing. Sure, yeah. Um, we started Faithful Word Baptist Church 11 and a half years ago in my living room. Uh, it was me, my wife, three kids, and a couple visitors on the first Sunday. And uh, we pretty much grew by 10 every year. You know, the first year we averaged 10, second year 20, third year 30, fourth year 40. And then about three, four years ago, really started to take off. So we run right now on Sunday mornings, like in the low 300s. And then on the evening services, we run uh, somewhere in the 200s, kind of fluctuates, but always above 200. And uh, we have 11 official soul winning times at our church. People get saved every single day, seven days a week. We have people going out soul winning. Um, we have right now about a couple hundred people getting saved every single week. And that that might sound hard to believe, but we literally have about 200 people going out soul winning every week. So in our church of 350 people, 200 of them are out soul winning every week. Many of them are going out multiple times per week. We also have an organized trip every week right now to the Indian reservation. So we'll fill up the church van and, and, and sometimes another vehicle as well and take them about three hours away to the Indian reservations and have a day or two of soul winning every single week. We have people signing up to uh, go preach the gospel to the Indians because the, the American Indians are really receptive, especially the Apache tribe. So uh, we're doing a lot of soul winning here in Arizona, here in Phoenix. Our goal is to knock every door in our whole county, 4.3 million people. So far, we've knocked the doors of, of probably about a million and a half people uh, toward that goal. But it's really speeding up because, uh, our, you know, our, our soul winning team is, is growing so much. And then also we, we go to other parts of the country every couple months and have a soul winning marathon in, you know, for example, we just did New Orleans. We've done them in Portland. We've done them in uh, Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Albuquerque, New Mexico, all kinds of places. So, OK, yeah, that I, that's incredible. I don't know if people realize just how big of a deal that is. I mean, to, you know, to think you got two thirds of your church sewing regularly that often. I mean, it really is incredible. It's something that I don't think is to be ignored. You know, your mission trips are a pretty big deal. Um, I haven't got to see it yet. I know you just released a DVD on your Guyana trip. And I actually had some people ask some questions about that, too. You know, first of all, was that even a real trip? Uh, apparently, some of those videos were on green screen. I've been told <laughs> uh, one of the videos where you're in the school, uh, you don't see the kids in there. Did that uh -huh. really happen? Did you really get kicked out? Or was this something that was staged just to get attention? Well, I mean, every single newspaper in Guyana pretty much reported on it. 108 Hindu temples in Guyana banded together and took out a full page ad in the newspaper condemning me and condemning the government for allowing me to preach in the schools. So I don't know what all these tens of thousands of Hindus were up in arms about if I wasn't even there preaching the gospel to their children in school. So. Okay, well, so yeah, you know, and yeah. You know. <laughs> Because, you know, apparently, and I'm not even getting the hard stuff yet, folks, all right? I'm, I'm, that's coming. We're still in the good, easy part right now. But, you know, there's a lot of questions because, you know, here's the thing. You know, you were on the Alex Jones show after your Border Patrol incident, and that has led a lot of people to believe that, you know, you're just kind of this, you're this CIA plant controlled opposition. And listen, all these things I'm bringing up here, too, I've heard these from the mouths of preachers, all right? Many of these things have been said from pulpits, okay? CIA plant. Uh, you're an actor, uh, you know, this stuff is staged, you know, Alex Jones was, you know, he's part of the conspiracy. A lot of people think he's controlled opposition. He had you on there that got you popular and you're just pretty much out there. They're saying to make churches look bad, you know, how, how do we know these things really happen? You know, did you really get beat up? You know, did you, uh, you know, what do you have to say about well this? You, you know first first of all my preaching was pretty widespread on the internet before the border patrol thing even happened in 2008 already because the border patrol thing happened in 09 i started the church in december of 2005 and by 2008 i already was having 10,000 audio sermon downloads every month before i'd ever been on the news a single time hmm just from putting a lot of preaching on YouTube. And, you know, frankly, I was one of the early people to get on YouTube. My sister told me about YouTube. I didn't even know what it was. I started uploading a lot of preaching. I was getting a million views on, on videos even back in uh, 2007, 2008. So I built up uh, a lot of listeners through YouTube and through 
you know, just uploading preaching to my website. But then in, in 2009 with the border patrol incident, yeah, I was on the Alex Jones show. I was also on about 40 or 50 other radio shows. Cause that was a pretty big news story. I did a live interview literally every day for almost two months. And then I just started turning them down because I was just sick of it because it, it, it gets boring to tell the same story over and over again. And I, even to this day, I don't really like to talk that much about the Border Patrol incident simply because it was eight years ago. And I'm just I'm on to other things. I don't like to dwell on the past. I talked about it a lot back then. You know, I care more about stuff that's happening right now. But as far as Alex Jones, yeah, I was on his show a few times, but now his uh, show actually condemns me because uh, they came out with some videos about a year ago condemning me that I was too hard on the homos. Mm. So, you know, I'm not in good graces with them anymore, apparently. Okay. So, yeah, now, and so tell us a little bit too about your online influence because uh, I've noticed just on the live stream of your church services, I mean, they'll be, I'll, most of the time when I get in, there's like 300 people watching just on YouTube. And don't you have people watching on Facebook and stuff too? Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about just how much your stuff is getting out there right now. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, well, we're, we're streaming on two Facebook pages and on YouTube live. And then every sermon that I preach Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, usually within about two days, it has about 4,000 views on that, on that video for a typical sermon. But if I preach on a really hot subject, then that should, that should hit 10,000 in a week. If it's a, if it's a pretty, um, controversial subject or an interesting subject to people some something a little more exciting than then it'll get more viewers like that but there's 68,000 subscribers on my youtube channel and uh it's 1 million viewers per month 1 million views video views per month and um if you look at it in the terms of minutes minutes watched it's right now it's at 17 years per month so what that means is that in one month, people spend 17 years uh, watching these videos. So basically, like if I were to, if I were to spend 34 years just talking to people 12 hours a day, every day, seven days a week without ever taking a break, and I just spent 12 hours, which would be impossible, but just 12 hours a day, I'm just speaking the word of God to people. Um, if I did that for 34 years. That's what the that's how many people the YouTube channel reaches in one month because it's it's 17 years worth of minutes of view time per month. So it's 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 really mind blowing just the power of the the internet, you know, just the power to to reach people. So, so and that's where I think people get a little suspicious too because if you search Baptist anything on YouTube or whatever, your stuff comes up first. Doesn't that seem to make it appear that you're kind of in cahoots with, you know, the higher ups with uh, whatever, whoever it is that runs all these things? You know, how do you how, how in the world do you do that? Well, it's, it's, it's simply because, number one, I was on there in the early days. I've been uploading videos and, and it seems that YouTube's algorithm, there is something to be said for seniority of just the fact that your channel has been around for 10 years. Um, not only that, but what a lot of people don't realize that I upload probably an average a lot of times of like 10 videos a day. So, you know, and it's not me. I have obviously people that work for me and stuff that help me. It's not all me doing it, but you know, if 10 videos are being uploaded a day, these other churches, they're not uploading 10, 10 videos a day. I mean, they're, they're usually probably not even uploading their three weekly sermons. I'm uploading 10 videos a day. I read books on, on how to, you know, do search engine optimization and everything. I, I, I fill the tags with keywords. And at the end of the day, you have to have videos that people want to watch. So, cause mm -hmm. you, you can market this stuff all you want, but at the end of the day, people have to want to actually watch the sermon. So, so you're basically just good at what you're good at what you're doing. You know what you're doing on that end. Most of us don't. And so, all right, well, anyway, and, and let me say this, I've had pastors contact me who are pre-tribbers and Zionists and people who disagree with me, but they were saved, you know, they're, they're soul winning independent fundamental Baptists. And they've contacted me and just said, how do you do it online? How is your channel so successful? And I wrote them back in great detail, explaining to them all my secrets. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to protect this information. Anybody who wants to ask me how I get my stuff out on YouTube effectively, I'd be glad to explain it to them and, and give them all the details because, you know, I want every saved soul winning fundamental Baptist to succeed, you know, 
So I, I'm not protecting this information. Any anybody who wants to could duplicate the success that I have on YouTube. You know, you got to put out short clips. You got to put out the full sermons, and then you got to break them down into short clips with catchy titles. And you got to, you know, it's all about just flooding YouTube with a lot of good content. Okay. Ten videos a day, twenty videos a day. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So that's the end of the nice stuff. All right. So I did. All I right. told everybody this was going to be this going to be rough. So listen, for those of you out there who uh, support Pastor Anderson and are for him, all right, um, understand what I need to do to make this interview work to accomplish what I need to accomplish. I need to kind of uh, embrace the spirit of the mainstream IFB that's against Pastor Anderson. And so I might have, you know, if you see me getting a little nasty and even, I don't know, maybe kind of ignorant saying some things that you're like, I don't think by the time he would believes that I'm trying to, I'm trying to be fair. Listen, there's people that are watching and listen, you know, I, I have B people that are not stupid, all right? They're going to know if I'm throwing you softballs, if I'm making it easy. But I do. I know that group. I know what they're thinking. Uh, I appreciate all these emails that I've gotten. I, I think you know, I'm not going to be able to cover everything that I want to cover, but I, I hope that I can at least, uh, I, I've got the spirit. There's kind of a theme, uh, some common things that people are concerned about. And, and I, I know what they're thinking. I know where they're coming from. And so I, I'm going to kind of play devil's advocate and I'm going to argue with them. So, you know, don't get mad at me uh, if I, you know, get a little ugly with them. This is what's being said. All right. And these things I'm throwing out here, too. I'm not just making you know, on the intro video. The only thing I made up in that I have heard every one of those things I've said about Pastor Anderson, except about him being the brother of Jack from Lost. I added that in just for fun because I think. That's a possibility, personally. Well, the, the real is, uh, accusation, though, is that I actually am Jack from Lost. That's the one I've heard a lot, where they claim that I'm an actor that plays Jack okay. from Lost, and I play Pastor Anderson. I've had I've had yeah, that I don't one think, thrown at me. I don't think you could pull that <laughs> off. I, I really, don't. but you know, really though, um, is it kind of flattering that people think that you're this CIA plant Jesuit? Uh, all these things, because you know what? Nobody's ever accused me of those things because, you know, people know I'm not smart enough to pull something like that off. I, I don't know. I think that I would kind of take that as a compliment if people thought that about me. I just think it's stupid and ridiculous, but. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, anyway, so no more, no more nice guys. So anyway, I, uh, I got to ask these questions. All right. And yep. these are, this is what people are concerned about. And so I hope you're ready for this. All right. This, maybe this whole Let's thing has been a long con so I can get you on here and I can uh, just expose you. And that will not that will promote me high up in the ranks of the IFB if I could take you down. But uh, anyway, here here we go. So first off, the thing that everybody wants to know, because once again, you got a powerful online presence. Uh, you know, you're, you're very well known out there. Uh, you're controversial. You know, with the things you say, they get heard and. You tend to do quite a bit of attacking. You do seem like you want to be the Baptist Pope. Well, you know, what make, and what makes you think you should be the Baptist Pope? Well, I, that's the last thing on my mind because I know that I will never be the Baptist Pope because, you know, barely any Baptist pastors will even touch me with a 10-foot pole, let alone want to, you know, follow my program. And, and and all I'm trying to do is be a good influence on other pastors, because I know that out of the 6,000 independent fundamental Baptist pastors in America that are King James only, very few of them are ever going to fully embrace faithful word Baptist church as, as their friend and brother. And that um, the vast majority of them will never have anything to do with me. And I'm okay with that. I, I have no goals of, of trying to be everybody's buddy or be political here. But I will say this. I, I think I've already been an influence even to the people that hate me because, you know, by by standing up and preaching really hard, for example, against the sodomites, which that seems to be a big point of contention between me and most of my fellow IFBs. That's one of the biggest issues that they that they hate me for. But even on that issue. You know, by me preaching really hard against the sodomites, I think it makes them preach a little bit harder than they would have. Because it's sort of like the, the Hegelian dialectic. They're not going to come all the way to my position. But I think that by preaching super hard against the homos, I've kind of brought them a little bit my way or, or held them accountable where they feel like they at least have to preach harder against the sodomites than they were. But, you know, I have no illusions of thinking that people are going to come all the way to my side. I mean, that's never going to happen.
but here's the thing though you do quite a bit to try to straighten out all the other baptist churches you know you send your dvds all over the place nobody yeah. asked for them you just you, you send them out there um you said you know you do know how to flood the internet it does appear that you know you're trying to uh you know in, in the way you attack too it's not just a matter of you uh, you know, this is your opinion. This is where you stand. This is what you do in your church. I mean, you you attack people. You go after people. You know, you call you you name them. You call them names. You know, you send out things about them. You know, it's just kind of attack, attack, attack. You know, and really, you know, it's none of your business what's going on in other churches. So why do you why do you do that? Why do you have to send your DVDs to other churches when they didn't even ask for it? Well, I'm just trying. I'm just trying to be an influence. You know, I I I love. The independent fundamental Baptist movement. I grew up an independent fundamental Baptist, born and raised independent Baptist, and I hate to see it going down the toilet, which is what I see. And so I'm just trying to be a positive influence. And if people don't want to listen to me, then they don't have to listen to me. But a lot of people do want to listen to me because I've already, you know, reached a few pastors and helped them and 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 uh, sharpened them up a little bit. And so I'm not trying to become the Baptist Pope because the way I look at it. This is honestly how I feel when I send out a, a DVD to all 6,000 pastors in America. I'm not trying to reach those 6,000 pastors. I'm just looking for maybe 10 or 15 or 20 that have ears to hear and let them hear. And if I send out 100 DVDs and 99 of them go in the trash and one of them helps a pastor to become a better preacher, a better soul winner, then great. I've accomplished my mission. And you know what? When I attack, these false prophets, I do it with a vengeance. You know, you're right. I take the gloves off because I believe that these guys are evil and they they have a huge influence and they're destroying churches. They're destroying America. And, you know, they're, they're bringing in the sodomites. They're, they're bringing in all kinds of blasphemy and heresy. And so I, you know, let them be accursed. Well, you know, here's the thing, though. You're fighting, you fight dirty. I mean, you're sending people into churches you know you 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 get these people you get them to infiltrate these churches they start distributing their dvds and uh, your dvds and then they end up splitting churches you know that's not the way you handle it that's not your place to do that you know you know i mean you just had a problem with, in your church with a guy kind of infiltrating you know going behind your back and spreading false doctrine and yet you're sending people into churches to do that very thing well, I've never sent anybody into any church to do that. And I people can listen to the last 11 and a half years of my preaching. And I have said over and over again, not to go around spreading doctrine that is contrary to the doctrine of your church. That's all I've ever said for the last 11 and a half years. And in fact, that's what I lived because for the first 24 years of my life, every church I went to was pre-trib. And for example, the church that I went to in Sacramento, California, Regency Baptist Church, I went there for five years. I didn't talk to anyone about the preacher rapture being false. All I did was promote the program of the church. Even my best friend, Roger Jimenez, who I spent hours and hours with every single week, had no clue that I didn't believe in the preacher of rapture until I got up behind my own pulpit and preached it. So I've never told anyone to go hand out DVDs at your church or to speak against the program of the church. That's just a bold faced lie. I've not sent in people to infiltrate. I've always told people to sit down, shut up and learn something. And if they go to a church that's pre-trib and if they want to address it with their pastor, they should take it directly to their pastor. And I said that they should be meek and humble and entreat him as a father. And if he's not receptive to it, then they should just let it go and be a blessing to their church, not a pain in the neck. That's all I've ever about, taught. Because, well, here's the thing. Well, what about these churches, though? I mean, I'm hearing about these churches where those very things happen and, you know, six yeah. families left the church. You know, what do you have to say about that? I mean, well, kind of you know, like some, of my, some of my listeners are obnoxious, but I didn't make them that way. I mean, I've never taught people to be obnoxious and to be a pain in the neck at their church. I've always taught people to go to church, get involved in the soul winning program, show an example of, of good soul winning. Uh, because, you know, a lot of these churches, they're going out and doing a door hanger or just inviting people to church or they're doing some, you know, real quick soul winning one, two, three, repeat after me. They're not really being thorough or in depth. I've always just told people, hey, just go to the soul winning program. And when it's your turn to be the talker, show them, show them the right way to do it. Show them a better way. But not to insult people or tell people that they're wrong. Just, you know, show them a better example. Do these things happen? 
Of course, but it's not me that's instigated these things. I mean, I can't be responsible for what all of my tens of thousands of listeners do. I mean, that's not my fault. I'm well, here's the thing, though. For it. People are, people are going to think that because, you know, here you are, you know, doing these major attacks on these different preachers. You know, you're sending the DVDs out all over the place. I mean, you said, you know, you know how to get the word out. And it just, it kind of looks to, you know, me and everybody else like they're following, you know, following your lead. Well, here's the thing. I'm sending these DVDs directly to the pastor. You know what I mean? So, I, you know, I'm going to the pastors of these churches and trying to get them to see the truth. And as far as putting my stuff on YouTube for anybody to see, yeah, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. But if you, if you look at the so-called damage that I've done to these other churches, you know, and then you look at the benefit that I've been, look, I've sent people to these churches because I've, I've preached so many times, Hey, you need to get into an independent Baptist church. Don't just watch online. You need to go to church. You need to join a church. And so, you know, lots of people from other denominations listen to my my sermons on YouTube because it because it's YouTube and it has such a universal reach. I mean, there's Lutherans and non-denom and Presbyterians listening to the sermons. And then they listen to my preaching, they get saved, and they join their local independent Baptist church. So some pastors that even disagree with me have written me emails thanking me, saying, hey, You've sent me a lot of church members. Thanks. This is great. You know, we've enjoyed having these people. And then other people just have a bad attitude because, oh, they're, they're, they're post-trib. When the timing of the rapture is not even the most important thing. You know, how we feel about some country on the other side of the world is not the most important thing. So those aren't, those aren't things to break fellowship over or to panic about. You know. Okay. All right. So I, I see that. But then, here, so another thing, though, that kind of goes along with that, you know, with the attacks and everything that makes everybody nervous. Okay. I so, said, you know, you've, you've hit some people pretty hard. And, you know, with me personally, um, you've gone after two just this year. I mean, you've hit hard two preachers that I love dearly, that I respect, uh, Brother S.M. Davis. If you, I, uh, during my teenage years, I probably listened to him more than anybody else than my dad for the Keith Gomez in my adult years. I probably listened to him more than anybody uh, other than my dad. And I mean, you have viciously attacked those guys that I love. So why in the world would I want to listen to anything that you have to say? So you, you, you're talking about this uh, DVD right here. Yeah. Burn that way. After all, it's got, you know, Bob Gray, SM Davis, Johnny Nixon. Well, it, but here's the thing about that, you know, on January 1st, 2017, I didn't, you know, make a New Year's resolution of, you know, I'm going to find a way to go after S.M. Davis. You know, I'm going to take down Bob Gray. I'm going to I'm going to really hit, you know, these guys hard. You know, Keith Gomez is going down. No, no, no. That's these fights were not chosen by me. OK, I can't just sit back and allow this independent Baptist online college to market itself to hundreds and hundreds of churches, maybe even thousands of churches as, oh yeah, it's an independent Baptist Bible college. It's going to be great. And then they have a guy teaching a class on there that sodomites were born that way after all, because they're born eunuchs. You know, this kind of perverted filth can't be allowed to go on. And I'm thankful that that class is no longer going to be taught and he's no longer teaching in that college mission accomplished. And so, you know, uh, how many children were spared being molested because we were able to shut down this weird doctrine that said, oh, these eunuchs, they make great children's workers. And so, you know, we need to we need to uh, accept them and love them and understand instead of realizing that, no, they're sodomites. They went down that Romans one path. That's how they got that way. They weren't born that way after all. And then, you know, this thing with Keith Gomez and Sam Gibb, you know, Keith Gomez had a conference whose sole purpose was to attack me. And, you know, I thought, I thought that was pretty funny. I, you know, I popped the popcorn and I tuned into it because, you know, I don't mind. I, look, I can dish it out and I can take it. No, uh, see, that's not true though, because <laughs> you were the, you were terrified of that conference and you tried to get it shut down. You sent your thugs in to stop. that. <laughs> I didn't send anybody in. And, and, you know, that, that conference, not only did I not get, try to get it shut down, 
I advertised that conference on my blog and said, oh, hey, well, there's this anti and, – and so well, a lot of my listeners were tuning in live every night. I, I think I probably really boosted – their, the, you know, how many people actually watch that conference. And well, here's the thing. I didn't, I didn't force Sam Gipp to get up and preach heresy and blaspheme the very name of Jesus. And I certainly didn't force Keith Gomez to get up and say, you know, we've heard some things this week that are new, but we trust our friend Sam Gipp to tell us the truth instead of saying, Hey, what he said was false. So I, I can't make these people promote sodomy and blaspheme Christ. So, you know, when I see these kind of wicked things going on, I call it out because nobody else is. I, I'd, I'd rather somebody else did it and then I could be their biggest cheerleader. But, uh, but, here, yeah, but here's, you know, here's the thing. You know, first off, you know, Sam Gipp tweeted that, you know, he tweeted one, uh, last week two got saved. A man got right with God and back in church in a meeting. S.L. Anderson and his thugs tried to stop. Whose side are they on? You know, mm. look at all the great things these guys do and that, that they have done. You know, what makes you think that you have the right to even mess with these people? Well, I don't even believe for one second that Sam Gipp is even saved. So he's never won anybody to the Lord in his whole life because uh, an evil tree cannot bring forth good fruit. He constantly preaches bizarre things, doctrines that no one's ever heard of. And honestly, if people actually knew what Sam Gibb believed, they wouldn't even have him as a guest preacher because they don't realize that he's a hyper dispensationalist. They don't realize that just the weird things. And, and look, Jesus not being his Messiah and Jesus wasn't really supposed to be named Jesus. I mean, that's just a very small sampling of this guy's crazy doctrine. OK, the guy is way, way far from See, being right a normal there, independent this Baptist. Is, this is where you're getting everybody mad at you. You know, who are you to take people's salvation away? You know, you took Sam Gipp's salvation away. He, he mentioned it at the conference. I was there. And then <laughs> the next, that that one night, you put that video out, flipping out about Sam Gipp's message. You basically said, everybody in that church wasn't saved. I, I was there. You took away my salvation, according to him. I want it back. <laughs> Well, here's the thing. I never said that everybody in that church wasn't saved. What I actually said was that anybody who hears what Sam Gipp taught about the name of Jesus and believes in it and agrees with it is not saved. And what's funny is that after saying that, Keith Gomez got up and said, he just said that you're all not saved. So basically what Keith Gomez is doing is he's just assuming that every one of his church members agrees with that bizarre teaching that Sam Gibb gave that that Jesus was named the wrong name and that he wasn't supposed to be named Jesus. And, you know, I don't have the power to take anybody's salvation away, but uh, but it, these people are insane to think that like just because somebody says they're saved, we're just supposed to just believe that they're saved. And these are the same people who call out Keith Gomez or, or, or whoever. Keith Gomez calls out Rick Warren and and Bill Hybels and he calls out John MacArthur when they preach heresy and lies and false doctrine. Yeah, but those guys aren't fundamental Baptists. These are fundamental Baptists you're talking about. Okay, well, about. I'm a fundamental Baptist. So if I'm a fundamental no, Baptist, then no, why you're not? You're post-trib and you hate the Jews. <laughs> so you're not You're not a fundamental Baptist. You don't, you're not a Bible believer. Sam Gipp also tweeted, Sleaze Anderson does not believe Romans 10, 9, and 13. He believes every person's salvation is subject to his approval. He's not a Bible believer. All right, so, you know, you're the one that's going around saying who's saved, who isn't saved. I've had several preachers tell me we're going to be in heaven with Sam Git. You know, you just need to get along with them. You know, there's a good chance. You know, what if God puts your mansion next to his mansion? You know, you better, you need to think about those things before you just go taking away people's salvation and just you deciding who's saved and who's not saved. Yeah. It's, it's so ridiculous because how many people do you run into out soul winning that just swear to you up and down? I know I'm saved. And there's some Pentecostal charismatic. They believe in work salvation. They believe you could lose your salvation. They believe all this crazy stuff. So not everyone that says, Lord, Lord is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven because there are going to be plenty of people who say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then Christ is going to profess unto them, I never knew you. Those are the Joel Osteens, the Benny Hens, you know, not the fundamental Baptists with PhDs. Well, you know what? I hope you're right. I, I hope that every Baptist pastor in the world is going to be in heaven 
but I don't believe that that's the case because there are plenty of Judases out there and there were false prophets among the people then. And the Bible says there shall be false prophets among us bringing in damnable heresies and even denying our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, and I'm not saying that, that everybody I've exposed is unsaved. I, you know, I hope I, the, the person I'm saying is not saved is Sam Gibb. You know, I'm not saying that Keith Gomez is for sure not saved, or I'm not saying that Bob Gray is not saved or SM Davis is not saved, but whether you're saved or not, when you're promoting sodomy or when you're putting these heretics behind your pulpit, then you got to be taken to task. And you know what? If I promote sodomy or put heretics behind my pulpit, I'm ready to be taken to task. Well, what about when it comes to, you know, you're talking about, you know, their fruits. You're talking about their preaching and using that against them to say they're not saved. Well, what about some of your behavior that you've been accused of? I want to read if this is a few more tweets is from Sam Gipp, all right? Well, this guy's a fundamental Baptist, okay? He's an evangelist. He preaches in a lot of good churches, okay? Churches that I know of. He's not just going to go and just lie about something on social media because he's going to get called out by people uh, in fundamental Baptist churches. They're not going to put up with this kind of stuff. And if they're putting up with it, it must be because it's true. And just some of the things that he said about you. And once again, this is America. Okay. If you get accused of something, the burden of proof is on you to prove that you didn't do it. And so, you know, here's, uh, I, I didn't know about this about you, but uh, first of all, he says, while Pastor Carlson takes on the porn king, Steve Anderson and his whole sleazy gang and hammers them. He also said, Steve, Porn King Anderson is like a spoiler. Five plus five equals nine. And anyone says it equals 10 is a heretic for disagreeing with them. And then also seems like pornography isn't Sleaze Anderson's only hidden sin. And you see the information on, on his Facebook. And so, you know, having said all that, you know, first of all, you know, what, what about that? You know, you, here you are, you're trashing all these other guys. When apparently you have a porn addiction. So tell us how long you've been dealing with that and how did Sam Gip find out about that? <laughs> well, here's what that goes back to. Paul Wittenberger in our church is a, a former Hollywood electrician. Okay. He was not a Hollywood film producer, Hollywood film director. He did not produce Hollywood films, but he actually did electrical work on Hollywood sets. He did lighting. And so they're going on his page on imdb.com where it lists every project he's ever worked on. And they're pulling out movies from 10 years ago, 12 years ago, whatever, and saying, this guy produced porn because he produced a Hollywood movie. And then look, obviously Hollywood movies are filled with smut. First of all, Paul Wittenberger never worked in the porn industry whatsoever. Okay. He worked on Hollywood sets. And a lot of times he didn't even know what movie he's even working on. He shows up at work. Hey, be there at this time, be at this set at this time, run these electrical wires, install this light bulb. And that's what he did. He didn't have anything to do with making these movies. He had no say about what the content is. A lot of times he didn't even know what the content is because he's just there. He runs wires, he sets up lights. And then the next day he's somewhere else. He doesn't even know what the movie's about. Now, let me just say this right away. I don't believe that it's right for a Christian to work in Hollywood or to do electrical work on a Hollywood set. You know, I don't think that's right. But here's the thing. Paul was at a time in his life where he was at a church, he was worldly, and so he worked on these these projects, but he never had anything to do with with porn production. And when it came to Hollywood, he was an electrician, he was a lighting guy, he was a grip but he was not a producer or a director or anything like that. But, but here's the thing. He hasn't worked in Hollywood for years. He moved to Arizona. He doesn't do any work in Hollywood. He doesn't do any work on TV shows. And a lot of times people will look at the date on a movie and say, well, this was only three years ago. And he's still, but what you have to understand is that movies are filmed in Hollywood, like two or three years before they come out. So you have to subtract a couple more years and understand. But here's the thing. You know, guys like Sam Gipp who want to throw a guy like Paul Wittenberger's past in his, in his face because he, he did something wrong in the past. You know, these are the same guys who brag about their sinful past. And, you know, I saw a video where Sam Gipp was bragging about 
being involved in armed robbery and how he was intending on just killing an innocent person and everything like that. You know, okay, that's his sinful past. He brags about being incarcerated at age 16 for auto theft or something like that. But but what's bizarre about this whole thing is that not only does Sam Gipp try to pull a Christian's past out and throw it in their face, something that they've already repented of and gotten out of, not only does he exaggerate it, lie about it, not only does he use the present tense and say that Paul is still working on this stuff when he hasn't had anything to do with it in years, but then somehow I have become the porn king just for being friends with Paul Wittenberg. I mean, that's pretty, that's a stretch. You know, I've never worked in Hollywood. I've never had anything to do with producing a Hollywood film or anything like that. So how did I become the porn king. I mean, that, that sounds like a pretty lofty title king. I mean, the porn king. Well, I just, you know, <laughs> I don't think a Baptist preacher would just make stuff up like that. All right. You know, he, I know a lot of his friends, you know, they're going to call him out on stuff like that and they're not. So, I mean, maybe he's got evidence, you know, maybe you're not telling the truth, you know, cause here's the thing too. You already told me that you have no desire to be the Baptist Pope. And I've been talking about how you've attacked these people and you told me, all right, this is something you told me, and I quote, but you said, I know I will never be able to put Sam Gipp completely out of business. There will always be the dispensational, backwoods, inbred, Ruckmanite churches that he will be able to go to, but I want him out of the mainstream IFB. What makes you think you get, you get to do that? Well, I just did. You know, he's already getting meetings canceled from, from uh, pastors who actually have a brain in their head. And, you know, the, here's the thing about Sam Gibb. People don't realize how bad he is. And if they realized how bad he is, he would not be invited to mainstream Baptist churches or mainstream independent fundamental Baptist conferences because, he, frankly, he's not mainstream. He is a fringe, radical Ruckmanite. And so that's where he belongs. He belongs preaching in all the backwoods, inbred, rucktard churches, you know. And look, there are some weird, super weird Ruckman churches that will always love Sam Gibb, no matter what he says and does, because they're even weirder than he is. But I just don't like to see him going and preaching at good churches, churches that are actually, you know, soul winning churches or, or halfway normal churches. I mean, you know, my old pastor. Uh, Pastor Stephen Nichols at Regency Baptist had him come in and preach, and I was shocked and horrified, especially since, you know, he, m m Pastor Nichols is not a Ruckmanite at all and never even leaned that way. And But but honestly, I tried to tell him how bad Sam Gipp was, but he didn't listen. I tried to tell him that he's hyper dispensational. He's like, no, I don't think so. It's like, well, yes, he is. So I'm just trying to just expose the truth. And if if people want to still have Sam Gipp after knowing the weird heresy that he teaches, well, then, you know, frankly, they're just as bad as he is. And then he belongs there. All right. Well, here's the thing. You know, yeah, he, he's preached some crazy stuff. But how about some of your messages? OK, what what's the deal? And I, I've never listened to the message. I hear people talk about it all the time. But did you preach a message teaching men how to pee standing up? No, I, I mean, I didn't teach them how to do it. I just said that they should be doing it <laughs> because, you know, there's this trend in Europe of uh, commanding men to urinate sitting down. And I simply show that the Bible uses the term six times, him that pisseth against the wall to refer to a grown man. And I was just saying how emasculating and effeminate and queer it is for men to be what's called in German uh, a zitz pinkler, you know, somebody who who sits down to go to the bathroom. So, all right. Well, so here's here's another thing too, and question people had too, because obviously, you know, I, I guess I have to quit saying Church of Fifty. All right, everybody's been talking about your Church of Fifty, but you know, you you guys do quite a bit. It's very clear that you know you have a lot of money with the way you're able to put off these videos the things that you're accomplishing apparently you know you got a million dollars after getting beat up by the border patrol is that how you got your money because we know no. no actually i didn't get any money from that border patrol incident it cost me money now people see me winning in court online but that was the criminal trial i was declared not guilty on all counts because i wasn't guilty but 
when I tried to sue them for damages, I didn't get anything. I didn't even get my own bills paid, my hospital bill, my windows being smashed in, my lawyer fees and everything like that. So actually that event ended up costing me about 10 grand of my own personal money. That wasn't the church's money because that that incident had nothing to do with the church. I was working in the fire alarm business and it was on a work trip that had happened. So I paid for all that with my own personal money, it cost me personally like 10 grand. The reason why our church does have a lot of money is simply because of the fact that we're not dumping it into building some palace of a building. You know, we just have different priorities. Other churches are just pouring tons of money into their Christian school and their education wing and the gymnasium and the the, the high steeple and the giant auditorium. We meet in a uh, office complex in a humble building. And yeah, we can fit 350 people in here but it's a humble building. So that frees up money to get the word of God out. So that's how we can just put out. Last year, we distributed over 85,000 CDs, DVDs, and flash drives. And that's not counting what's sold because Paul Wittenberger has a separate business where he sells documentaries that I'm featured in and he sells materials that that include my preaching, but, but just what we gave away for free alone was about 85,000 units last year. And it's going to be even more this year because we put our money toward getting the word of God out there, not toward building palaces. And, and not only that, but part of the reason why our church has good money is because the amount that comes in the offering plate, even more than that comes in from outside our church, people donating online or, or, or sending in a check. And that's simply because they're learning from the preaching. They enjoy the preaching, so they want to contribute. And, and they know that if they donate to our church, we're going to use it to get thousands of people saved. We're not going to dump it into some building program. Or you guys are going to use that money to do more damage. And so are some of these, you know, who are some of these outside people? Are you being funded? I've, I've heard multiple times from pulpits that you're funded by Hamas. We have no large donations coming in. Everything that comes in, I go out to the mailbox. The, the largest donations that come in are like a thousand bucks, maybe two thousand, maybe two thousand bucks. Uh, you know, uh, at the most on a check. One time, seven years ago, somebody wrote our church a check for seventy five thousand dollars. That was seven years ago. Since then, we get donations that are usually twenty bucks, fifteen bucks, thirty bucks, a hundred bucks. But it all adds up because there's just a lot of people listening. So you're so, dodging. What about Hamas? Well, you know, is there anything else you want to ask me? No, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> I mean, Hamas, I, I'm not even 100% sure who Hamas is. Is that the terrorist organization in yeah. Palestine? Yeah. because Is that you, Hamas or is that or is Syria Hamas? Yeah, you. Where uh, is Hamas? Sure. Which one is it? You don't I even know. I think they're in Palestine. <laughs> they're the Palestine. Okay. They're the ones trying to kill the Jews. And you yeah. were seen, you were in Dearborn, Michigan, wearing a black free Palestine t-shirt, handing out anti-Jewish DVDs that you were written in Arabic, you know, the Jews and their lives. <laughs> what in the world was that all about? What were you doing there? Well, I mean, we were there to get people saved. We're on a soul winning marathon and we were trying to win people to Christ. But, but they're Muslims. So <laughs> <laughs> they hate the Jews. Yeah, but they still need to be saved. And so, look, when we went, that was actually our first soul winning marathon in a distant city. That's where the whole concept of soul winning marathons came from. I had this idea of translating marching design into Arabic and taking it to the most Muslim city in America and handing it out in Arabic because the movie was actually dubbed into Arabic to just give it out and have a big soul winning marathon and to call it Marching to Dearborn. And people thought we were crazy. Even friends of mine and, and loved ones were scared for my safety because they said that if I went to Dearborn, uh, I, I could be beheaded. I might be beheaded in the streets of Dearborn or stoned. And they told me to go on YouTube and look up a video of Christians being stoned in Dearborn. So I looked it up on YouTube. It turned out the stoning was uh, Muslims throwing empty water bottles at this obnoxious provocateur, uh, Reuben Israel. So, you know, that that's not exactly a stoning when somebody throws an empty water bottle at you. But anyway, when we went to Dearborn, we wore those free Palestine t-shirts 
And honestly, it caused people to be way more receptive to the gospel. I mean, there were people that I was walking up to them and they're kind of just like this. And then they, I got a little closer and they saw my shirt and they're like, oh, you know, and then all of a sudden they want to talk. So we sat on the, no one stoned us or beheaded us. We actually sat on the porches of many Muslim homes. They, they gave us cookies and tea and they listened to the gospel. On that soul winning marathon, we had four, I think it's been a long time, but I want to say it was 42 people saved and about 12 or 13 of them were Muslims because a lot of the people who live there are not Muslim. And obviously the, the Muslims are not the most receptive people. So we had like 12 or 13 Muslims saved and about 30 people uh, that were not Muslims get saved. But you know what? We've won lots of Muslims, Lord. In fact, I had the privilege of just baptizing an entire Muslim family a couple months ago who got saved as a result of watching Marching to Zion and then watching other preaching and other videos. And they changed, they had all the Muslim names. They even changed all their names to Christian names. You know, like when Christians become or not Christians, obviously, but fake Christians will convert to Islam and they'll they'll take on these weird names like Muhammad Ali or something. Well, these people did the opposite. A whole family that that uh, took on Christian names and got baptized at Faith Forward Baptist Church. And and I just talked to another guy a couple weeks ago who was raised Muslim and he he got saved as a result of listening to that sermon. So you know, th look. Of course, the Jews and their lies, it was the title of the video. The Bible says, who's a liar, but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He's antichrist that denieth the father and the son. And anyone would have to admit that the Jews do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ. And they certainly don't believe in the father and the son. All right. Well, so here's I, I kind of to change directions a little bit. I, I still got a lot more I want to get to. I well, really I want to say to something else about that free Palestine shirt. Okay, go ahead. Because people try to say, hey, that's a Muslim shirt. Or, you, you know, you're wearing yeah, why an Islamic. You just wear a turban? <laughs> yeah, well, here's the thing about that. Why would we not want people to be free? You know, I want all people everywhere to be free. The Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So being for a free Palestine instead of the Palestinian prison camp, which is the way it is right now, where they're all walled in and barbed wire and blockaded and embargoed, you know, we should want freedom for all people. You know, the people in North Korea are some pretty wicked people, but I, I even want them to be free. I wish that they would have freedom there as well. And, you know, when it comes to siding with Palestine versus Israel, I don't side with anyone except Jesus Christ. I don't give a flip what's going on on the other side of the world. I believe that we should mind our own business and not meddle with strife not belonging to us. But when it comes to Israel versus Palestine, I know this, only 2% of Israel's population is Christian. And those 2% are virtually all Arab Christians. It's virtually none of them are Israelis. Okay. And then I know that amongst the Palestinians, about 6% of them claim the name of Christ. Obviously, they're not all saved. You know, they're all different denominations of Christianity. But the bottom line is there are actually a large number, a huge number of Palestinian Christians, whereas Palestinian, I'm sorry, Christian Israelis are virtually non-existent. So, you know, I, if I'm going to side with anybody, it should be my brother in Christ. I'm not going to side with the Christ rejecting Jews. And, you know, Muslims and Jews are equally damned. Because neither one of them believes that Jesus is the Son of God. All right. Well, here, it's just kind of a change direction a little bit. So, first off, you, know, you realize you are the poster boy for the post trib anti Zionist movement. You recognize that, don't you? Great. I hope so. All right. Well, so, here, so here's the thing you know, why aren't you more careful about appearances? Okay. You know, some of the stuff you do is crazy. And frankly, you know, when you start getting out of hand, um, it makes it difficult for us who maybe are in agreement with you doctrinally, but then, you know, we're always constantly answering for all your crazy antics and stuff. Why aren't, why aren't you more careful? You know, why do you do things like, you know, kicking your pulpit, jumping up on your pulpit, you know, cussing? I, I, you know, these are things we have to hear about all the time. You know, why, why do you do these things? Well, you know, what What cuss words have I been saying? You told a guy to get the H-E double hockey sticks out of your church. 
<laughs> well, you know, personally, I don't believe that hell is a cuss word. I don't believe damn is a cuss word. I don't believe bastard is a cuss word. I don't believe ass is a cuss word. Because frankly, these words are all in the Bible. And the Bible says every word of God is pure. And the Bible says that we should consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if Tipper Gore says that these words are offensive, but the Bible uses them, then I'm going to go with the Bible and, and Tipper Gore can go jump in a lake. But can't, aren't you taking, you know, yeah, biblical words, but, you know, using them in an inappropriate way? Well, you know, it's funny how people just have these these ingrained ideas of that's a cuss word. But there's no biblical basis for that. And, and and you know what? It's it's funny. Somebody even told me, I've had multiple people, hey, you took God's name in vain. And I said, when did I take God's name in vain? Well, you told the guy to get the hell out of your church. I'm thinking like, since when is God named hell? You know, I would never take God's name in vain or Christ's name in vain because, you know, that, you know, God's not going to hold him guiltless that take of his name in vain. But, you know, frankly, I'm not misusing these words because the Bible uses the word hell in a literal sense. And it also just uses the word hell in a figurative sense, like when it says that the tongue is set on fire of hell. You know, I mean, if somebody's saying bad things, obviously their tongue is not literally set on fire from hell. But that's no different than me saying that something's as wicked as hell or get the hell out of here. You know, those aren't bad words. And look, there's enough commandments in the Bible. We don't need to add commandments. You know, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. So I'm not going to follow man's commandment that tells me, hey, don't use these Bible words in your slang or whatever. These pastors that are attacking me, they use slang. They use figures of speech all the time. You know, okay, they're staying off of Tipper Gore's disapproved words list. Well, I'm not. And I, I think that the devil has an agenda to demonize these words like hell, damn, bastard, piss, to get people off the King James Bible because those none of those words occur in the modern versions. You know, the modern version will never say bastard or piss or ass or anything like that. It takes all that out. So by teaching people that these are bad words, then you're 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 actually pushing people toward the new versions. And you're actually now you're being more holier than even Christ. And if you're too holy for the words of the Holy Bible, well, maybe you're just a little too holy. And you should lighten up a little bit. All right. Well, you know, all, all things are lawful. Not all things are expedient. I don't know that that's necessarily profitable uh, doing that kind of talk. But, you know, what What's about the – go ahead. No, go ahead. What, so what about the temper tantrums, though? You know, kicking a pulpit, you know, jumping up on the pulpit. You know, we have to hear about these things all the time. Well, first, first of all, that used to be what every independent fundamental Baptist did. You know, usually that was the criticism you'd hear from the watered down liberal contemporary churches. But fundamental Baptists have a long tradition of screaming, beating the pulpit, foaming at the mouth, throwing things, kicking over microphone stands. I mean, that's just part of being a fundamental Baptist. And the Bible says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, smite with thy hand, stomp with thy foot. You know, th that's the Bible's mandate. So, All right. Well, so righteous we anger. And back to, you know, so back to appearances, because, you know, obviously, you know, people are going to use that, you know, they use the pictures, the clips, and then, you know, see this crazy guy. And so I wanted to hear what you had to say about that. But then another thing I get a lot, you know, and you kind of touched on this before, but I, I want to get kind of specific on this. But, you know, whenever you have done your attacks on people, I, one thing that is very common, and I think a lot of it's on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook. I don't see these. I see it on YouTube, though. But, you know. Some of your followers get really nasty and use some really vulgar words. Why don't you ever tell your followers to cool it? Well, I have I have toned people down before, but I you know I can't just be on there full time, just toning everybody down. But uh, you know I've I've preached whole sermons on being nice and being friendly and being gentle and being appropriate, and so you know I I can't just sit here full time moderating comments on my YouTube channel or it would literally be the only thing that I did all day just because there's a million views every month. So it just it's it's too much. So okay well here and so here's another uh question I had. This is one that was emailed in. Um but you know of course it's gone around, you know, it's out that you got kicked out of Hiles Anderson College. 
And one of the things that um, somebody emailed, apparently uh, his pastor was in the class with you and you stood up in class one day and you said something, I guess you've said something in that to the teacher in the classroom and in the next few days you were gone, apparently kicked out. So what was it you said that got you kicked out? Yeah, that is such a lie. And, and I can't even believe that anybody would, would say something like that because here's what happened. I was doing great at Hal's Anderson. I was on the Dean's list. I have all my report cards. I've got my Dean's list certificates. I've got the trophies from succeeding in their ministries. And I left Hiles Anderson, frankly, because Jack Scopp was preaching all kinds of weird heresy. And before I left Hiles Anderson, I called back home to my pastor in California, Pastor Nichols, and told him the weird stuff that was being taught. And he said that I was right to quit Hiles Anderson, that I was right to leave. And of course, I was later proven right when Jack Scopp was exposed to the whole world as a, as a pervert and a weirdo. So not only did I not get kicked out of Hiles Anderson, I was thriving there. I was excelling there. I got mostly A's. I was very active in the ministry there. I won awards there. And I never had any problems when I was at Hiles Anderson. And the only time that I ever got up and, and started yelling in the middle, of, there was one incident where I got up and I began to shout in the middle of a class but I was actually yelling at another student and I was defending the teacher and the teacher was nodding his head saying amen as I yelled at and told off another student because there were students in the class who were trying to say that you could get saved without knowing the name of Jesus. If you sort of just looked up into the sky and called out to God, whoever you are out there, please save me without the gospel, without the name of Jesus. And they were arguing and I just couldn't believe it. So I just sort of just lost my temper and blew up and I stood up and I yelled about that. But the teacher appreciated it and was on my side. And the teacher was Al Lacey, he was a guest lecturer. And it was in a summer school session on the King James Bible. And so, you know, there were, there were about 30 or 40, maybe even 50 people there to witness that. That was the only time I ever spoke out of turn in a class, and the teacher was was uh, on my side. Okay, I was defending him, and 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 so you know I paid my bill when I left the college, and I even paid for the time that I didn't use because you know I was like I was in my senior year. I'd already ordered my cap and gown. And I was like a month and a half into the semester. So not only did I pay for that part, but I paid for the next three months. I paid the percentage that you're supposed to pay if you quit early. So I paid my bill. I left on good terms. I shook the hand. I walked out of there with every, you know, the best way you could leave Bible college. You know, so this this thing of me getting kicked out, where's the proof? Uh, it's been where's repeated from pulpits. Where's the proof that I was ever even disciplined at Hiles Anderson? Where's the proof that I ever had any problems there? Yeah, I, I'm just, I'm telling you what people are saying, all right? This stuff's being said, by, it's being told me by preachers, all right? So, I mean, you know, that's why I'm asking. You know, I don't I don't think, you know, these are men of God. I don't think they lie. And uh, this next question, I, it, this kind of might be kind of an inappropriate question, but uh, it's out there. But you know, is it true that you and your wife fornicated with each other before you got married? Absolutely not. And I didn't fornicate with anyone before I got okay, married. Well, then was... how in the world have you guys had nine kids in 10 years? Well, we've been married for almost 17 years. Well, that's not uh, what I heard from the pulpit the other day. Well, in a, in a month, we're going to have been married for uh, 17 years. And we didn't even have our first child until we'd been married for 13 months. And I was a virgin when I got married. I never fornicated, period. Uh, and my I've wife heard. and I, the first, look, my wife is the only woman that I've ever been with. And the first time that her and I, did the act was on our wedding night. Well, the, these things, you know, these things are being said from pulpits by men of God. I don't think they would lie. And, you know, if I want to believe it, you know, I think I got an excuse. So if it fits my agenda, but. Oh, I got, I, I just pulled this out here. This is my, uh, here's a couple of my certificates here. Dean, Dean's list at Hiles Anderson college, 2003, 2004, 2004, 2005. So. 
All right. And I got all my report cards here and everything like that. So. All right, fine. We'll let that one go. So, all right. Well, here, here's another question that was emailed in. It said, um, I had preached a while back that one of the problems with the books that people are writing right now is people end up spending the rest of their life defending everything written in that book instead of, you know, teaching the Bible. So the question is, would you be willing to change any of your teachings if you found out you were wrong on something that's in one of your DVDs? You know, for example, uh, Babylon USA. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't, you know, obviously I haven't seen that yet, but you know, there's a lot of people that are even on your side that don't necessarily buy into the whole USA being Babylon. You know, would you ever change your position on any of these things you put in your DVD? Are you going to be doing like a lot of these book writers spending the rest of your life defending your DVD? No, I would definitely change it. And even in Babylon USA, the caveat is put out there that if this happens anytime in the near future, or if it happens in our lifetime, then it would be the United States. I mean, if the, if the end times and the second coming of Christ doesn't happen, for another hundred years or 200 years, then who knows what other empires are going to rise and fall. And at that point, all bets are off. But at this time, the USA is the only country that could even come close to fitting the bill of being Babylon. So that's what I believe. And, you know, the Revelation series is 22 hours long. That's a 22 hour DVD. And I cover a lot in that series. I cover everything in that series. But if there's something in there that is an error, then I would definitely be willing to change it. Now, I spent a lot of time studying and working really hard to make sure that everything I put in that DVD is accurate because I knew that it would be enshrined, you know, in a DVD. And, you, you know, you don't want to have to go back and, and, and change things. But... I would definitely be willing to do so if, if I had to. And so then, look, there are some things in my early sermons. If you go back to my sermons from 2006, 2007, uh, there are minor things that I was wrong about that I've since recanted and changed on. But, you know, I still leave those sermons out there. I don't take those sermons down because it wasn't anything huge and you know, I mean, I'm I, I'm not trying to hide the fact that I made a mistake or taught something a little off at some point because I'm a human being. Of course, everybody makes mistakes. Okay. So, all right. So, no, another question that got emailed, you know, with regard to doctrine and practice, it says Pastor Anderson would undoubtedly tell Christians to follow the Word of God in all things. A lot of folks hold up Stephen Anderson's preaching as the ultimate rallying point for the post-trib pre-wrath movement due to his great influence around the world. Given his great popularity, how can we make sure that the average Bible believer does not hold Pastor Anderson in such high esteem that we supersede our loyalty to the Word of God? That seems to be what happened to some degree with Jack Hiles. And you know, whereas nowadays some hold his views and other great men of the past in such high esteem that they refuse to be corrected by clear scriptures. So, you know, what what are you going to do to keep that from happening to you? Because, you know, I, frankly, I'm not going to be your Bob Gray that just goes around talking about you for the rest of my life. Yeah, I think that the best way to keep that from happening, and I tell this to people all the time, is that we need to lift up other men of God and other examples. We need other people to step up and do the same amount of work that I'm doing, and, and then they will be on par with me or even surpass me, and then it won't become a cult of personality because there is a danger – for there to become a personality cult. And there were a lot of people with, with Brother Hiles that kind of had a personality cult with him. And, I, you know, that is a danger. And I think that the best way to stop that from happening is not for me to start preaching less or winning less souls or putting out less DVDs or doing less work to reach people. It's for other people to be uh, lifted up as well. And, and the good thing is that, you know, for a while it was just me and a couple of guys in our movement. And then you could see that being a danger. But the great thing is now there's like 15, 16, 17 of us. And I think in the next few years, there's going to be 100, 200, 300 of us. And then I'm going to be less important at that point because, you know, it's not going to be just one voice crying in the wilderness. It's going to be a lot of people saying these things. So, you know, I don't want to be number one. I don't want to be um, 
at the top or something like that. You know, I just want to do my best. And I would love it if, for example, my best friend, Roger Jimenez, I would love to see his church outgrow Faithful Word Baptist Church. I would love to see him, you know, uh, uh, do great things. And, and, and any of my other preacher friends, the same thing. So, you know, so that it, it, that way it's not just about one person. We, we should all be equals or peers as fundamental Baptists, independent pastors. We, we should all be peers and equals. There should be no hierarchy. But these guys are the ones with the hierarchy where certain guys are untouchable, these, these kind of fundamental popes. You know, I just want to be treated as an equal, and, and that's how I'm going to treat everybody else who's a pastor. Okay. So another, another one of the questions I had emailed is, you know, and this is a thing that you're known for. And this is something that we hear about, but, you know, a lot of your hate preaching, for example. And so, you know, uh, just kind of two questions that kind of go together. You know, where are we commanded to hate anyone? You know, you teach we should, uh, you teach we should, yet God never says so. Therefore, why should I accept your presumptuous doctrine over God's clear command to love? And then, and why do you desire for certain people to perish? How can you claim to have the mind of Christ if you openly desire the exact opposite? Well, because there's plenty of scripture that teaches hate. And for example, Second Chronicles 19.2 says, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. So I don't want to have God's wrath on me by loving those who hate the Lord. That's and Old Testament. It, you know, a new commandment I give you, love your enemies. You know, well, actually, no, that the, the new commandment was that you love one another as I have loved you. That's the new oh, commandment. Right. Lo love your enemies is not a new commandment because the Old Testament teaches you to love your enemies. I mean, the the, the very verse, love thy neighbor as thyself is Leviticus 19.18, which is right between God telling you that the Sodomites are an abomination in chapter 18 and that they should be put to death in chapter 20. And then right between those two is Leviticus 19 telling you to love your neighbor as yourself. If your enemy's ox or his ass, oops, it cussed again. If your if your enemy's ox or ass falls in the ditch on the, you know, you, you pull it out and you, and if he goes astray, you lead him home again. So Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. We were supposed to love our enemies. Then we're supposed to love our enemies. Now I do love my enemies. I love my personal enemies, people that do me wrong and despitefully use me and persecute me. But I do not love pedophiles. I do not love haters of God. Sodomites are predators. They're evil and they're made to be taken and destroyed. And I am not going to love those who hate the Lord. David, the man after God's own heart, said, do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved to get with them that rise up against thee? I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. So, you know, but can't I'm basing we, it on that. Can't we love them? I mean, because even if they're bad, you know, yeah. they're our enemies. Okay. That's the category we're supposed to love. You know, they're our neighbor. We're supposed to love our neighbor. And just, you know, this hatred of wanting to just see people die, you know, just, uh, you know, wanting Obama to, you know, die and go to hell things like that. You know, why can't you talk more about wanting these people to get saved? You know, God's not willing that he should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, you know, but that they'll turn from their ways. You know, why it, you know, so anxious and, you know, some of your followers too, I don't have time to read through the whole email, but some of the things that they've said are pretty nasty about looking forward to certain individuals dying, uh, you know, having a celebration when these people die. I mean, this is getting kind of freaky. Well, here's the thing about that is that, you know, if we believe in the death penalty, which is clearly taught in scripture, which to my knowledge, fundamental Baptists still believe in the death penalty. I, at least I sure hope so. Well, then we should obviously want people to die if they, for example, committed first degree murder and God said they should be put to death. Then we should desire that God's will be done and that they be put to death. And yeah, if God just... said that homosexuals should be put to death. We should desire that God's will be done. And, and here's what I want to know. Do these people think in the millennium that there's just going to be sodomites out and proud marching down the street during the millennium? Jesus Christ is going to rule on this earth with a rod of iron. And he's going to institute his perfect laws. But can't we be sad, you know, that we didn't get to them in time? You know, that they're well, okay. kind of going to these hell. Are the same yeah. people, these are the same people that rejoice when when uh islamic terrorists are killed 
These are the same people that rejoiced and partied and rallied when Osama bin Laden was killed. But that's OK because Fox News told them that it was OK. Well, I'm going to rejoice when I see the vengeance, as the Bible says, the righteous shall rejoice when he seeth the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. What that's about Bible rejoice verse. not when thine enemy falleth? But that's talking about your personal enemy. This isn't talking about haters of God and enemies of all humanity. In the book of Revelation, you want to talk New Testament. You can't get any more New Testament than the last book of the Bible. And basically, when people are drinking blood in Revelation 16, he says, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they're worthy. How about the when the fifth seal is opened in Revelation 6 and the, the martyrs are saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So we have the martyrs, and they're not in sin because they're already in heaven. They don't have the flesh to make them sin. Up in heaven, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, they're begging God to pour out his wrath and judgment on the wicked. And I mean... People who have a problem with that need to go back and read the book of Psalms. And usually when you buy a New Testament, usually it has the book of Psalms attached to it. Usually it's the New Testament and Psalms because the New Testament even commands us to sing the Psalms. And most of your imprecatory prayers and, and hateful things in the Bible are found in the book of Psalms. Okay, well, what about the verses that's in the Old and New Testament too? Uh, for example, in regards to leaders in government, you know, about not speaking evil against the rulers of the people. You know, it's in Deuteronomy 22, 28, I believe it's, it uh, was, that was quoted in Acts chapter 23, verse 5. You know, is that something, that, and somebody emailed this, is that something that's just for the nation of Israel, the high priest? Or, you know, do you think it's okay to go around cursing, you know, Obama or Trump or any of our leaders? Are, aren't we speaking evil against the ruler? Well, first of all, Obama is not even a legitimate ruler of our country in the first place. He, he, you know, he was a total fraud and he's 3000 some miles away from me. And people are saying that he's the king, you know, honor the king and all this. Well, he's not the king. We live in a constitutional republic and the highest law in the land is the constitution. It's not a man that we enshrine as a monarch or a king. That's not our system that we're under. So he is not even our ruler. That's not our system of government where we have this ruler or this monarch or this king or emperor. That's not what he's even supposed to be. He is just an executive. He's just a president. He's just presiding over the government. And when he is a terror to good works and when he is spending my tax dollars to murder babies and everything. Well, then that at that point, it becomes similar to when the children of Israel are ruled over by the Philistines or the Midianites or something, you know, and God didn't expect them to look to those people as their legitimate authority, some foreign power from 3000 some miles away, some baby murdering sodomite promoting hater of God. And I frankly believe that Obama is a sodomite himself. There's been plenty of evidence. Plenty of people have come out from his past, Larry Sinclair and everybody else, you know, telling all the stories about him being a sodomite. And there's, there's plenty of evidence for that. Well, so, even with all that though, the Bible says, you know, to honor all men. All right. And he, you know, he's, he's an individual. He's a man. You know, we're supposed to be, uh, you know, showing honor to people. And so, you know, to just, you know, be attacking people like that. It's not setting well with a lot of people. And there's, there's a lot of verses about, you know, kindness. And well, but, but here's the thing though, we have to take the totality of the Bible. You can't just take a statement honor all men and take it out of context. Look in the Bible and see John the Baptist preaching pretty hard against Herod for being divorced and remarried. I mean, Herod married his brother, Philip's wife. So, you know, he preached hard against him. That's what even got him beheaded. And Jesus said, among them that are born of women, there is not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Why wasn't he just, you know, honoring and, and treating him well? And, you know, when it comes to the, the quotation that's made in Acts, you know, the Apostle Paul saying, oh, yeah, it's written. I shouldn't speak evil of the ruler of my people. It, it's the high priest. And personally, I think that 
uh, the Apostle Paul was wrong in that instance anyway, because the Apostle Paul is not God. I mean, he, ma he made several mistakes in the book of Acts, like when he went and got his head shaved and did a Nazarite vow and everything. He wasn't supposed to be doing that. I mean, the book of Galatians that he wrote speaks pretty strongly against observing those type of Jewish feasts and customs and and times and and seasons and so forth and so you know for him to recognize the high priest is is uh is not legitimate because jesus christ is the high priest well here's the thing veil had already been rent before that so that guy was a a, a poser i mean that guy was a a fraud that that so-called high priest in the book of acts because well, that system was done when you're talking about all these government things you know you use a lot of old testament references and you got to understand too in the Old Testament, you know, they had a theocracy, you know, they had the word of God. And so obviously people who were going against that and their nation, these people had a right to get upset about that. OK, in America. All right. You know, we have a different type of government. And then as Christians and as believers within America, we are strangers and pilgrims in this world. All right. We are not under a theocracy like they were back then. God knew we were always going to be strangers and pilgrims. You know, he knew we were going to receive the persecution and all these things. And knowing that we were going to live in a world where people were going to be against us most of the time, he's telling us, you know, to, you know, submit yourself into the higher powers, you know, to fear God, uh, fear all men, honor the king, not quoting any of that, right? But all those commands that he gave in the New Testament, you know, he's saying that knowing they're living in a world where, you know, the government, and every and everybody's going to be against them and so you know for us to try to claim it that you know go off old testament ways doesn't really seem well i you fit. know i i believe in following those new testament commands i'm not saying to ignore those commands i'm saying that people are taking those commands and twisting them out of context because i do believe that we should obey the law of the land that's why i pay my taxes that's why everything about our church is legal Everything about my personal life and personal finances is legal. You know, I believe in following the law of the land. But to get up and honor some perverted, sodomite, filthy, wicked leader, these are the same people that would then, they'll, they'll turn around and praise pastors who were refractory in Germany when Hitler was in charge, they'll turn around and praise those guys for not just going along with the flow. But then in the United States, when we have evil people taking over, perverting our nation, and frankly, perverting the world, when you're sending a sodomite ambassador to all these other countries and, and ruining our testimony as a nation, ruining our testimony as Christians, making people think that America is a Sodom and Gomorrah, I don't believe that God is telling us to not preach against that guy, not call that guy out. I think we should be more like a John the Baptist and call that out. All right. So in kind of a change of direction here, we, we need to try to finish this up. I don't want to take too much of your time. No, you're a busy man, but you get accused of being a troublemaker quite a bit. All right. And, you know, you seem to like to stir things up and cause trouble. And one of the things about you, I know you're a man of languages. You know, I think, you know, you speak Spanish, uh, German, you know, languages. Okay. But it, it seems like when it comes to a lot of doctrinal things, particularly in the end times, that I feel like sometimes you're trying more to cause trouble than actually win people over. Okay, so for example, then what I what I need you to do right now, I want you to answer a few doctrinal questions. Okay, and I need you to use your knowledge of languages to help me out here because one of the things that I get a lot is you know people accuse you of believing crazy things that I know that you don't believe. And the thing is, I have a hard time convincing them of that because I find clips. You know, there's clips they can find out there of you saying things that in their language is different, okay? The pre-tribbers, they own definitions of words when it comes to end time thing. For example, one of the reasons I quit listening to you in the beginning was because you used the term post-trip. Well, that means after seven years. That means you think we're going up in the rapture, you know, while everybody else is coming down on white horses in Armageddon. And I knew that was stupid. And it's like people hear that for, um, you know, replacement theology, okay? When you say replacement theology, everybody else is thinking, you think the Gentile church replaced the, you know, God's chosen people, the Jews. So when it comes to, you know, 
I, you know, so first, first of all, before I kind of get in the next part, you know, do you hate the Jewish race? Well, first of all, there's no such thing as the Jewish race. But if there were one, I would not hate them because I don't hate Jews. I don't hate religious Jews. They are some of the most hardened people to the gospel and, and some of the most difficult people to get saved. But no, I absolutely do not hate them. The only people that I hate are sodomites reprobates okay so and in fact we just had a young man i just had the privilege of baptizing a young man three weeks ago who was born and raised a devout jew and he got saved through listening to my preaching and i was able to dunk him just three weeks ago so that's great you know and and the most loving thing we could do for the jews is to get them saved one, one time i was out soul winning like seven years ago and i was able to win a devout jewish lady to the lord after about 45 minutes of, of preaching of the gospel i don't have a lot of stories like that because they're pretty much the most unreceptive people on the planet but i've won a few of them to the lord and i hope that i can win a lot more of them to the lord so okay. i don't hate them at all well if you don't hate them then you know why do you teach the satanic hitlerian catholic heresy of replacement theology well replacement theology is just biblical and I don't let them define the terms. So, you know, I'm going to use replacement theology for what I believe. And I'm going to use post-trib for what the Bible calls the tribulation, which is only everything up until the sun and moon are darkened. So, so define, replacement, these, de define replacement theology. Well, the, 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 the nation, the, the physical nation of Israel has been replaced by a spiritual nation made up of all believers whether they be Jew or Gentile. So, so what about we, we those... used to have a physical nation. Now we have a spiritual nation. It's been replaced. Well, so what about all those who are part of the physical nation in the past? You know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all them. Are they out? Well, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob aren't even on this earth. So what are we talking about here? Well, because you're saying <laughs> that God, you know, that the physical nation, all those yeah. promises were too. You know, to right. you know, all them, you're saying that that was taken away from them and given to well, no, the it was, it the was New given, Testament church. It was only taken away from the physical nation because they rejected Christ. And here's the thing, the, the individuals amongst the physical nation who believed in Christ are still God's chosen people because we went from a physical nation to a spiritual nation. So, for example, the Apostle Paul. He was a part of that physical nation of God's chosen people. But since he received Christ, now he's a part of that spiritual nation. So he wasn't replaced. The only people that were replaced were the people who didn't believe in Christ. And since Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all other saved Old Testament saints, they are in Christ because Jesus Christ died for them. And he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still part of the chosen people because the chosen people is anybody Who's saved? So you think we're a part of the same body that the Old Testament saints were in? Absolutely. And we're not set. We're, it's not didn't a new thing. It's get the same olive tree. It's the olive tree where the unbelieving branches were broken off, and we were grafted in. But it's the same. It's the same olive tree. So, but the, the, but there's a new covenant. The old covenant is no longer in force. Now it's been superseded. And that's another word that they like to throw around, what supersessionism, supersessionism, I think. Yeah, amen. Because the New Testament supersedes the Old Testament. And so, you know, we got to go with the New Covenant. The New Covenant says, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Gentile, it's whether you're in Christ. So where does that leave Old Testament unbelievers who are of that physical line? Well, they're burning in hell right now with every other unbeliever. All right, well, so here's the thing too, though. And one thing that kind of proves, you know, you've been saying you don't hate Jews. All right. I get what you're saying about replacement theology and all that. But one thing that can, that always proves whether somebody's anti-Semitic or not is you deny the Holocaust. Yeah, well, and here's the thing about that is that, you know, it, it, I think it's pretty weird that believing in the Holocaust is like an article of the faith now. You know, I don't understand why, as a pastor, I'm required to believe in 
a certain historical account to prove my orthodoxy, my religious orthodoxy, is that I believe in a certain account of history. That's not a biblical issue. That's a totally secular issue about what we believe happened historically or whether somebody believes in 9-11 truth or whether they believe the official version on 9-11. Since when are these tests of, of fellowship or tests of religious orthodoxy? And when it comes to the Holocaust, the word Holocaust, most people don't even know what it means. And the thing that got me investigating the Holocaust in the first place was I was reading the Bible in Spanish. And I got to the part where Noah gets off the ark and he offers up a Holocaust unto the Lord. That's what it said in the Spanish Bible, un holocausto. And I saw that and I was like, huh, what's he doing offering up a Holocaust? So I went and looked it up and I realized that the Holocaust means the whole burnt offering. Have you ever heard of someone being called caustic? If someone is very uh, uh, acidic or burning in their language when they talk about something, it's caustic. So cost is that Greek term that has to do with burning. Holo means the whole thing. Holocaust means the whole burnt offering. And it's the idea that the Nazis were exterminating every Jew, that they had a plan to exterminate all the Jews, and that the reason we don't have six million bodies is, you know, if you kill six million people, you should have six million bodies is because they were all cremated, supposedly down to nothing. Bones, teeth, everything cremated. So uh, the Holocaust teaches that six million Jews were murdered and cremated. And I don't believe that. And, and, and it's easy to disprove. And I did a whole video on it that disproves it. Now, obviously, of course, there were many hundreds of thousands of Jews who died in World War II. And by the way, there were about 70 million other people who died, including Russians, Germans, Americans, British, French. I mean, World War II was one of the most horrible bloodbaths of all time. And of course, many Jews were murdered in cold blood. And of course, the Nazis hated the Jews and wanted them out of Germany. But the, the final solution and these extermination camps, they're a myth. All right, well, it's an exaggeration. You know, it's not a test of orthodoxy if you're going to believe the Holocaust or not, but it's a test of whether or not you're not a moron. Because if you deny <laughs> the Holocaust, you know, you're an idiot. And that's just, that's just the fact that has been spoken to me by many people, many preachers, and it's reason to just throw you out because... Uh, they were there apparently. Well, have they know. seen the have they seen the evidence? Well, have, Bill Brady he just released a whole book that he spent a zillion hours putting together where he paid a whole bunch of money to get all these pictures in there that are really hard to get, you know, proving six million people got killed. I haven't seen the book yet, but well, um, I wonder you know, that that must be like a fold out or a centerfold to get that photo with the six million. And well, that's gotta be know, quite but, a photo. You know. You're so bad for not believing that. He wouldn't spit in your face, uh, what he told me. So, uh, anyway, that's – but, um, ne you know, next question that I have for you. You know, some some would say you take really strong stands on trivial matters. And, you know, while I think, you know, most would agree that it's fine for you to be passionate about what you teach, your attitude scares people away from wanting to associate with you. So – you know, my question is, you know, what does one have to do? Uh, what, what does one have to follow, you know, to be your friend? You know, how controlling are you? You know, how much Kool-Aid do they have to drink? You know, wh what is it? Well, I know, you know, in order for a pastor to be my friend, they just have to be King James only, soul winning, and believe in salvation by grace through faith. Those are my three main tests of fellowship right there. So... They don't have to agree with me on the rapture. They don't have to agree with me on Israel or Babylon or the Holocaust or on music or on, you know, um, childbirth or anything like that. You know, they, they, they just have to agree on the main essentials of the faith. And obviously, you know, if they come out with some heresy that actually affects salvation or that's just an extreme apostasy, then I would break fellowship. So the type of things that I've broken fellowship, for, first of all, I gave you, those are my three tests of, of orthodoxy. The just salvation by faith, soul winning and King James only is, is what I'm looking for in a, in a, in a pastor to be friends with. But the things that I've broken fellowship with people over are just bending over backwards to bring in homos 
or or try to soften the teaching on homo. And look, if people don't believe that homosexuals are reprobate, that's okay. I, I'm friends with them. There are people in my church who believe that homosexuals can be saved or people who think that we shouldn't hate them. And you know what? I can get along with people like that as long as they'll admit that it's an abomination and that we don't want them anywhere near our children and stuff like that. You know, as long as they're not trying to bring them in and 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 fill the church with with transvestites and everything like that. And then I've also broken fellowship with people over, you know, denying the Trinity. If somebody denies the Trinity, if they either deny the deity of Christ or if they're teaching, you know, uh, oneness Pentecostalism, obviously I would break fellowship over that, something huge like that. But I'm not, you know, I don't expect people to be just like me. So we're, yeah. we're independent Baptists. Yeah, with the whole Trinity thing, I, you know, the Tyler Baker thing, of course, that was very disappointing. Uh, the one thing that was the hardest, toughest for me on that whole thing, I, I like Tyler Baker. My wife wasn't a big fan of his. And she, uh, she kind of thought he was a punk. And I was always like, no, I think he's a good guy and all that. But then... <sighs> You know, this happened, and so now my wife gets to do one of those I'm right moments. And so now it's like, you know, six zillion times I'm right to her four now, and I'll never forgive him for that. I hate when she's right. But anyway, uh, that that upset me quite a bit. But anyway, so you know, what would you say to those who maybe agree with you on things like post-trib, but they're scared of being associated with you? Well, they need to just – reiterate the fact to people that we're independent Baptists. And so just because you agree with me on one thing doesn't mean you're going to agree with me on everything. And even my close buddies, even Roger Jimenez or or uh, even guys that we sent out of our church to start churches like David Burzens and Donnie Romero and, and other pastors that we fellowship, you know, we all disagree on little things here and there. I mean, you know, it's you don't have to be in lockstep. So if somebody says, oh, well, how dare you hang around with Steven Anderson because he says X, Y, and Z. If you don't agree with X, Y, and Z, you can just say, well, you know, that's what he believes, but we're independent. And, you know, most, most independent Baptist churches, they give lip service to being independent, but they're really locked into these certain crowds and these certain circles. And that kind of determines who they can and cannot fellowship with. I think we should just be truly independent. And we should be able to hang around with whoever we want and 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 shun whoever we feel is a heretic, you know. And and I don't think having a different belief on end times or on history is heresy or on politics is heresy. I think heresy is when you're denying the Trinity or when you're denying salvation by faith or when you're teaching that hell is not real or something. I mean, that's heresy. So you would allow me to continue, keep being friends with the people I've been friends with, you know, even if it's Keith Gomez yeah. and SM Davis that you've attacked. I'm allowed to be friends with them. Absolutely. Thank you for your permission. <laughs> 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 oh, I mean, yeah. So, final final question. I that we've there's there's a, a lot of little, you know, there's a lot of doctrinal things that I, we just don't have time to get into. It would just it takes up too much time. A lot of these things take long explanations, but the, these have all just been kind of been the main, you know, theme of questions that I've been getting from people. And it's kind of a main you know, thing that I hear all the time. There's a lot of little things, people, uh, I, I've got all kinds of things I could bring up right now. We don't have time where, you know, people have taken some of these clips where you've said things that sound one way. And, you know, and I, I try to tell them, you know, if you go listen to the whole message on that, you probably uh, find out, it's not what you think and we don't have time to go into all those things but you know what is the end game for pastor steven anderson you know what is your your next step in your plot to take over the ifb you know who's going to be the next preacher that you get angry at and you get the angry villagers with the pitchforks and torches at going after you know because people are calling you an accuser of the brethren well i you know i have no clue because, you know, like I said, I didn't expect any of these fights to come to me. And I have no clue what kind of weird junk, you know, phony preachers are going to come out with next that I need to, to fight and attack. You know, my goal and, and my goals are to get the gospel to every person in Arizona, to finish knocking every door in Maricopa County, to knock all the doors in the small towns, to reach every Native American with the gospel, 
Um, so I have all kinds of projects. We're producing him CDs. We're producing uh, documentaries. And I want to try to be the best influence that I can on my fellow pastors. So I want to just win people to Christ, pastor my church. And I do want to be a positive influence on other pastors because I know that there are bad influences out there. And, you know, frankly, here in Arizona, you know, a lot of my fellow independent fundamental Baptists, they're all looking to people like Paul Chapel. And Paul chapel has got hundreds of, of pastors looking to him. And he's watered down. He's liberal. He's soft on the sodomites. And so I don't want those kind of people to be the only people that are influencing our independent Baptist churches in America. There needs to be another voice out there that represents what the fundamental Baptist used to be like, something that's a, a harder edged type of preaching. And we need somebody to push people toward aggressive soul winning, hard preaching, taking strong stands, conservative music and everything like that. And not just let these, these Bible college fundamental popes, you know, water everybody down and soften us all up and make us all into pansies and, and put us all in a, in a lavender shirt and a pink tie with all these Bible college bozos. So, you know, I'm just trying to be another influence. All right. Well, Hey, people, I, if people don't like it. They can take it or leave it. And if people don't like me, then they can go, they can go to, you know, follow whoever they want. But a lot of people do like what I'm saying. And, and, and if, if what I say is so offensive and it scares everybody and turns everybody away, well, then why does my YouTube channel keep growing? Why does my physical church here keep growing? Why do we keep having to knock out walls to accommodate the growth? You know, somebody must somebody must be appreciating this kind of preaching. So, you know, he that hath an ear, let him hear. If somebody else wants to follow uh, a softer version of fundamentalism, well, you know what? That's great. They can have their uh, IFB light church, and then you know we'll have extra strength over here, and then people can choose. Variety is good. All right. Well, hey, I really appreciate you doing this. So, you know, I know this isn't going to satisfy everybody. We're not going to change a lot of people's minds, but I wanted people to just get to hear some of these things, hear you talk about some of this stuff. And because honestly, you know, like I said, I, you know, most of these things, I, I knew what your answers were. I've listened to your preaching enough. And, you know, all I can say, there's only one pastor, Stephen L. Anderson, you know, and I don't think, you know, anybody is asking anyone out there to be him. I don't think you're asking people to be you. You know, God only made one Stephen Anderson, but I would like to see more men who will actually become real independent Baptists. You know, we need more boldness. Uh, you know, we need to take the Bible. We need to preach it with authority without compromise. And I'm, I'm not seeing it in the mainstream IFB. You know, I'm not seeing people calling out names. You know, I, 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 I don't want to pick on some people, but, um, you know, I, I love, I love brother Dennis Coral. I listen to him preach a great message, preaching against dispensational salvation, a, a great message. And it's like, but the thing is, you know, he's not, not only is he not calling out the people that are promoting this in IFB, he's lifting up a lot of these guys that are promoting it in IFB. And, you know, it's, I think it's sending a wrong message. I think this dispensationalism stuff is garbage. You know, I was content to be quiet and just kind of mind my own business and do my own thing. But, you know, when I heard, you know, with, with some of the, the, since I've been seeing a lot of this dispensationalism stuff get promoted, since I've heard some of the crazy heretical teachings that I've heard, you know, the Jesus isn't, wasn't supposed to be called Jesus, you know, the Jesus isn't my Messiah thing. And listen, I went into that conference and, and you can, you can verify this. When I went to that conference, once again, I hate being wrong. I talking to you, I stuck up for Sam Gibb. I, I thought that you were being too hard on him. I thought you, uh, you know, should have maybe had him give him a chance to clarify that whole Jesus, not the Messiah thing. And something that you said that was interesting in that conversation, you said the reason he says things like that is because he actually believes it. You know, I, I tried to give him the benefit of the doubt. And honestly, when I heard him clarify that whole thing there, I thought what he said, clarifying it was worse than what he had originally said. And I, you know, I'm brokenhearted at the fact that we're, we've allowed the Ruckmanites into our group, allowed this dispensationalism stuff to go around. It's horrible stuff. 
And, you know, a lot of the IFB guys, they still know how to yell loud, but they're not saying anything, and it's not getting the job done. And people say all the time, you know, I see, you know, I like you, Brother Tommy. You're not as crazy as Pastor Anderson. You don't take things as far as he does. Okay, but at the same time, I'm not accomplishing what he's accomplishing either. And so I don't I, – I have a problem – with us focusing so much attention, bashing the guy that actually is getting some of this done, promoting some of these things like he is, somebody's got to do it. And I didn't want to be me. You know, I am just running a church of 50. I, I am one of the small guys. And I was going to ask you, too, if you do succeed in becoming the Baptist Pope, can I be the Archbishop of Illinois? <laughs> Uh, well, anyway, we'll we'll see what happens. But anyway, I do. I appreciate you doing this. Only Pastor Anderson is crazy enough to let somebody come and ask him questions like this. Some of these questions, too, makes me sick that I even ask them. They're completely inappropriate. We don't do treat anybody else this way. We don't ask them those questions. You know, we don't hold them accountable in the same way that we do him. I don't think that's really fair. And you know what? Yeah, you don't have to like everything pastor anderson preaches and the pastors especially that are out there you don't have to like everything he preaches but you know what you don't get to lie about it and all these things that i brought up i'm i'm hearing these things from pastors and you know you ought to be ashamed of yourself if you're just gonna just make up these crazy stories and conspiracy theories and lie about them you ought to be ashamed of yourself if you allow people to come into your church and and teach this kind of stuff i had enough of it i'm not dealing with it anymore if I want a fellowship with Pastor Anderson, I'm going to do it. If we, I want to have him come out here and we do a soul winning marathon out here and I have him preach in my church, I really don't want to hear about it. I am an independent Baptist. I'm not a dependent Baptist. And so uh, I thank you for doing this. I appreciate it. I appreciate everyone who's listened. I hope this helped. I hope that this wasn't softballs and soap bubbles. I hope it wasn't a tickle fight. <laughs> I tried to... Uh, uh, I tried to push his button a little great. bit. It was, it was really believable. All right. Well, I, that's good. <laughs> that's the first time I've ever done anything like this. Not professional. But anyway, so I do. I hope you all enjoyed this. And so uh, share it. Show it to your pastor. Show it to your friends. And, uh, you know, this isn't about promoting Stephen Anderson, but this is about promoting being independent. It's about promoting, you know, hard preaching, soul winning, you know, being doctrinally pure. And we need to make sure that we work on these things and we get and that we get better. And so thank you so much for listening. I hope this was 